This is just a little quickie here on the alignment procedure. A lot of you guys have already done some alignments and everything, and it never hurts to talk about it a little bit more. And then, come on in. You don't want to miss it. Basically, what you got here for your uh, pre-checks, you're looking for stability and handling. So basically, if you've got issues with the front end, uh, anybody ever uh, uh, work on a go-kart, the steering on a go-kart? You know, they basically got, you got little uh, ball joints on the end of it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this one guy that was building one from scratch told me that steering geometry was so complicated, he didn't know how they did it. <laughs> you know, because he was basically building all the parts to build the, the steering for a go-kart. The toe out on turns and all that, making it work, was really tricky. And he was really surprised at that. But your suspension, your wheels, your steering. Let me ask you this. What is uh, unsprung weight? This is a term that you need to understand the meaning of. Unsprung weight in regard to steering and suspension. The weight is not resting on springs? Yes, that's a good answer. Weight is not resting on the springs. Like, so what is not resting on the springs? Give me something that's not resting on the springs. What about everything that's below the springs? Lower control arm, tires. That's the, the springs are not carrying the weight of the lower control arm. They're actually sitting on it. And all, so that's unsprung weight and all that. So bearings and tires all operate together as a group. Uh, so your best alignment system, no matter how good you are, can't compensate for wore out parts. If you get up there, and a lot of times if you get, you know, you just get all into the notion of pulling the car up there and doing the alignment right quick without looking at any of the parts that are worn out, you may still have trouble the way it drives and all that. And so uh, anybody that hasn't pulled the car up on the lift, set the machine up, anybody that doesn't think they can do this without assistance needs to be working on it. You know what I mean? You need to be practicing it. You need to get familiar with it. You need to get acclimated to it. And just doing one alignment and saying, yeah, yeah, I got it, and walk away, that don't work. You better do several. I mean, heck, if you want to pull your own vehicle up there, you know. I mean, some of you guys have already done several alignments, you know. And it doesn't hurt to have a partner, but in some cases, when you have partners, one partner will hang back and let the other one do all the work, and then he'll get the worksheet signed off, and you know what I mean. And so, uh, but so be thinking about this. You've got to be able to do an alignment uh, like Part of your final exam is going to be, you know, we're going to jack some uh, numbers out of shape on a car that has got good, you know, I mean, I'm not going to put you anything up or we're going to use a torch to heat this stuff up, but we're going to have the, have the alignment all fouled up on a car and you're going to have to drive it up on the left and you're going to have to set, hang the sensors and you're going to have to set it all and I want to see the report when you're done and you're going to do it by yourself with no help and all that kind of thing. So everybody needs to be able to do stuff in as much as possible by themselves except for something like pushing a car, you know what I'm saying? All right, so anyway, you're gonna look and ensure all the steering and suspension components are in a simple working condition. Obviously, too, it's ridiculous to do an alignment without checking the tire pressure first. Now, you guys that have done alignments, do you always check the tire pressure first? Do you check the tire pressure first? Always check the tire pressure first. That'll get, you know, 25 points off of your final exam score if you don't check the tire pressure first. It's always the first thing you do. Look at the condition of the tires, see how they're worn and all that. If you're working on a pulling concern and you've got tires that are all just mismatched and screwed up and all that, you know, you're probably going to have some pulling if the tires don't match each other. Uh, let me ask you this. For, this is a slightly different thing. How, why is it a bad idea to put the donut on the front of the car if you have a flat? If it's a front wheel drive car. It'll wear out. The differential goes crazy if the tires are different sizes. The differential basically has one tire roll faster than the other when you go around the curve. But if you put a donut on one side, on some of these little Asian cars, they'll destroy the differential if somebody puts their donut spare on the front and they drive the car for very long. So it's best to take it. What you're supposed to do is take, if you have a flat on the front, you're supposed to move the tire that's not flat from the back to the front and put the donut on the back. That's just kind of ridiculous. I don't even like those donuts. You know, I'm only a full spot spare. Anyway. Uh, so basically, depending on the steps that were followed to verify the customer's concerns, some of the pre-checks may have already been performed. So if somebody was, if they're listening, if they say it's popping or it's doing this and that and the other, uh, then they're basically you may be have already looked. Now, let me ask you this. You may not have heard it by this name, but who knows what a dry park check is? Nobody knows. What you do? Now, some of you guys have probably done it. 
where somebody says, I feel something loose in my steering and I don't know what it is. You lay under the car on the ground with your flashlight and you tell somebody to sit in the car and move the wheels so you can see where the slack is. You see what I'm saying? I mean, because you can't just lay under there and look a lot of times to see. So you lay down and look while they're moving the wheel. You'll see worn out parts if it's got any. You know, it's a lot of times ball joints, you got to actually take the weight off of them and grab the tire before you can see them and stuff like that. So, you know, the dry park check is basically letting the car sit on the ground and get under there and look and see where all the slack is. Then you wait. That way you know what parts need to be replaced. That's the preparation. All right, rapid shoulder wear means what? If it's wearing out really rapid on the shoulder of the tire, what does that mean? Camber? No. Simpler than that. Huh? Not enough air pressure is going to wear it out on the outside of the tire. You've seen that, haven't you? You've seen that before? What about the rapid wear, wear in the center? Too much air pressure, overinflated. You know, of course, you've got cracked treads. You know, that's all. Now, you, were, you picked out the one that had the deep uh, cracks in the tires on the front of the Pacifica because of the and the problem, well, the reason tires come apart whenever they've been, uh, you know, cracking like that, is water gets in there and it gets between the tread and the steel belts, and they slowly lose their bond, and over time, centrifugal force causes them to separate, and then the, the thing tears apart. Now, Daniel said he hit something in the road on his uh, blazer when he flipped it five times, but that wouldn't have caused that tire to come apart like that and throw all the tread unless it was already, the thing he hit in the road was the catalyst for change. <laughs> That's what it was. You know, the thing he hit in the road cut the tread and it started it flopping. But his tread had separated from the tire long before that, he just didn't know it. Because it's not going to separate and come off on a, long, on a long ribbon on a tire that hadn't already been damaged by dry rot. Any tire that's been on the car for longer than six years needs to be replaced, even if it looks good. Don't run a tire longer than six years. The date's on the side of the tire. You'll see that little sort of a mitochondria shaped uh, depression and it'll say 4012 or 4312 or 2212 or 2308. That's basically the week and the year. Like 2308 would be the 23rd week of 2008. And uh, when you look at the tires, this thing may not be on the outside, it may be on the inside. So anytime you're mounting tires, start paying attention, if, unless it's white ladder and they want it one way or another. Uh, if it doesn't matter which way you put it and you're putting new tires on there, find the date of the tire, the, the age of the tire, and put it outside so when somebody walks by they can look and see. Because a lot of the times they're telling it toward the inside and you've got to look under there and uh, you know, get under the car to see what the age of the tire is. Uh, feathered edges is typically causing uh, from toe. You know, toe is dragging the wheel down the road sideways, and that'll typically feather the edges. You can run your fingers across the tire and tell if it's got that. You may not always see it exactly like you got it drawn, but you can feel it. Uh, you know, scalloped wear, you got that, is typically, you know, from this chimney and stuff and all that. Uh, and if you've got bald spots on there, that'll, they don't have those drawn very well. Uh, you ever have to lock the car up and slide when you didn't have ABS? you ever done that? If you've done that and you've got tires that are already pretty well worn out, you may have a flat spot on one of the tires. Now after all the rubber is gone from that place, or if the rubber's a heck of a lot thinner, then as you wear it off, that's going to keep wearing and after a while it's going to get down to the belts before anywhere else did because you locked it up and, you know, ground off a bunch. Like if you're on a really rough pavement and it shaved off a bunch of rubber off of a tire that didn't have a lot of tread to begin with, you may have one spot that wears out before the rest of the tire. That's the kind of thing that happens with that. Where on one side would be camber, which is what he was talking about, and uh, so on and so forth. But pay attention to the tire, you know. All right. Check all four tires for correct air pressure. Bingo. See what I'm talking about? Uniform tire I mean, wear patterns. Correct size and profile. Appearance of abnormal wear patterns. And a lot of you were talking the other day, and I've seen a zillion of these. These great big tall tires that are so gigantic when they turn the wheel, they start hitting the fender and they can't turn it about 10 degrees, <laughs> you know? I mean, I saw a guy pulling up with a gas pump on a Caprice the other day, and it ordinarily would just be pulling in there and get gas, and he literally had to seesaw his way in there because he couldn't turn the wheels very far. You know, I mean, you couldn't turn them as far as you ordinarily could. But anyway, uh, the other, uh, this morning, uh, one of my dual enrollment students, he just started driving a Chevrolet pickup he's got, and uh, he's got, it had a lift kit put on it, a really high lift kit by somebody before he ever got it. And, uh, and the tires have got so much negative 
camera. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, now somebody put a lift kit on it, and the camera adjustment is always already as positive as it'll go, and they're still like that, you know, because of the how they go the lift kit change the geometry. Huh? The vehicle for optional suspension equipment, that's heavy duty handling or trailer tow, and check the attitude for evidence of overload or sagging. If you look in the luggage compartment and they've got a bunch of dead bodies piled on one side of the car and the other side ain't got nothing, it might be sitting like this, right? So check for evidence of sheet metal repair. If it's been painted, if you can tell that it's got orange peel paint on one side and the alignment's not right, you may go in there and find out that your steering axis inclination is all fouled up because it's been bent. You can't adjust that. Got to go on a frame straightener and get it straightened out. All right. Disable the air suspension if the vehicle's equipped with it. It's got to be disabled prior to lifting it with a hoist. Now, on this particular hoist, the drive-on hoist is typically not a big deal on the air suspension. But if you're just raising it up, if you don't turn off the air suspension and you raise the car up, what happens? Turn off the air suspension before you put the lift under it and raise it up if the wheels aren't going to be sitting on something. What happens then? And why? The wheels drop. The ride height sensor is telling the car is sitting too high. What does it do? It lets all the air out of the airbags. And then when you set it back down, it squats down on the lift and everybody's going, ha, ha, ha. You know, because you didn't turn off the air suspension. My dad's car is like that. I've done that with his car here. Forgot to turn the damn gum air suspension off. Well, now it's got springs under it. That's not going to happen. If it's got ramps, drive it over the rack. If the alignment rack uses jack and it uses stand, raise it with a hoist. You know? So ours has got stand. I mean, these rolling jacks, so if you need to get it off there. you got to center it. you got to make sure you center it. How many times you drive one up on the rack and you say close enough is good enough, and then when you get under there, if you feel like you need to jack it up, you know, you can't reach right to the right places to jack it up, you know. It needs to be centered on the rack as much as possible. Stop it just before you get to the turn pads and leave it in neutral. Put a chalk behind one of the back wheels and then you can move these turn pads forward or back depending on the length of the vehicle that's set up. You move the little pad and swap places with it in the turn plate. You'll see what I'm talking about over there. Well, roll it forward by hand onto the turn plate and then pull the pins out. Because if you bind it up, and by the way, roll it back off the turn pins before you back it off the lift, particularly if it's front wheel drive. Because if you've got the pins out of the turn pins and you put it in the rear wheel drive, it'll go bang and it slams that $500 turn plate all the way to the front. You know, those are 500 bucks a piece. But you got to have it centered in order to achieve the proper alignment readings. Uh, make sure each wheel on the vehicle right over the center of the slip plate, and that's these things right here. If you're doing a four wheel alignment, pull the pegs out of the back plates too, because they float. They don't turn, but they float. If the wheels aren't in the middle of the turning angle gauges, they won't turn effectively from the floor of the caster's plane. Raise it off the floor, grab the upper and lower, see if you got slack. It's three and nine, six and twelve, you're paying attention to that. If they shake from the top and the bottom, then you pay, check your wheel bearings. Also, your ball joints will show, you know, whatever you're doing that. In a lot of cases, you turn it back, feel back and forth. What if you got slack this way? Dum, dum, dum. Have you ever seen inner tie rod ends that are worn out? In, in a steering rack. Like maybe the outer tie rod end out there at the wheels is fine, but the inner tie rod end will have slack in there. All right, check for loose suspension, steering button nuts and bolts, check the steering gear mountings, make sure that they're not moving around. I've seen it where the steering gear was left loose by somebody, and when you're turning a wheel, the rack and pinion's moving back and forth, which is really dangerous. You know, if it comes out of there, you got issues. Broken or worn suspension springs. Leaking or damaged shock absorbers, we were talking about leaking shocks earlier. The steering shaft, U joints, boost for rips, cuts, or leaks. And check for the brakes dragging because they're going to make it do things too. All right, look at your ride height measurement. This is a sort of a simplified shot of it. On the uh, machine that we got over there, it's going to tell you how to measure the white ride height and where to measure it to. That's when you're really, really, really wanting to be accurate. Most of the time, if you look at it and it looks like the ride height's okay, you know, you don't need to worry a whole lot about anything. But ride height may be something you'll deal with if you're getting into one that's really giving you a hard time. Don't confuse ride height with trim height. Trim height's how level the body looks and is measured from the vehicle body to the ground. So basically, you're wanting from unsprung to sprung components. Is what this is talking about right here. Like if the spring is between here and the body of the car, you're wanting to know, does it have weak springs? If you've got weak springs on a short, long arm suspension car, you're going to have camber that looks like this. Okay, remember that. All right. Look at the illustrations on the alignment machine to determine which points to measure, what the specs should be, what the allowable tolerances overall inside the side are. What if you had a 60, 
eight Mustang that you were aligning in your machine didn't have the alignment readings for it. Huh? <laughs> no, what you do is, I, I, well, you know, what you can do is you can find those alignment readings, usually on ladder somewhere, what they're supposed to be, key them into the machine. I mean, typically most front end machines will have a place where you can put in the right readings and then it will bounce off of those, you know. Uh, take the right height measurements, compare them to the specs and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I hang that, don't drop the sensors, use the bumper buggy strap, don't feel like it'll be aight, you know, because that thing falls off, somebody's got to pay for it. Run out compensation. The guy that sold me this machine said if they're aluminum wheels, you don't typically need to do run out compensation. And, you know, sometimes when we're training, we don't, but you always need to basically make sure the machine knows how the run, how much run out there is. Run out meaning if the wheels are maybe got a little bit of lateral run out, that has to be compensated into the angles that the thing's looking at. That's what it's all about when you roll it backwards 45 degrees, roll it forward, you know, all that stuff that you have to do. That's one reason you're doing that. That's cool though, because instead of having to raise the tires up and turn them and compensate each one separately, you can do them all at once. On that one, that's pretty neat. On the ones that have these big reflective paddles, you roll it back and forth too to do that. All right. Now lower it onto the slip plate, set the parking brake, jounce the front suspension. You know why you do that? You don't want it to be in a bind. You want it to just be where it wants to be. That's the same way when you're setting your toe. You want it to be where it wants to be. You don't want it in a bind. Make sure the caster swing is executed from steering wheel, not a front wheel. A lot of front end mechanics will grab the wheel and turn the wheel and watch the screen instead of turning the steering wheel. You guys have been doing it right. What you guys have been doing is setting somebody's fanny in the seat. And now, now if the person that's sitting in the seat is a big heavy fanny, it may change some of your angles. Got it? On this one over here, we're going to close the big doors. And we're going to make sure that the cameras don't get uh, confused. Uh, and here's basically if the measurements within specs don't bother to adjust it. The only time adjustments be, should be made is when it's out of specs. The side to side difference is great enough to cause a pull or a wear pattern. Uh, and remember I've always said this, the most negative caster and the most positive camber if it's on the same wheel, even if both of them are in the green, will cause it to pull in that direction. And just because you got them in the green, if you still got to pull in that direction, look for a positive camber and negative caster on the same wheel. Got that? Most alignment systems, camera and toe readings are live, but not caster. When you adjust caster, and basically adjusting caster is, bas is whenever you're moving the ball joint front to back. You got to do another caster swing to see how it changed, because it's not going to be live. It looks live, but it's not. So on the camber is live, toe is live, it's on the front. Do the rear wheels first if you got four wheel alignment stuff. All right, so caster and camber has got to always be adjusted first and toe last. Well, the adjusted toe doesn't change caster or camber, but the adjusted caster and camber will change toe. And remember, start with the rear one. All the rear adjustments should be made first. All right, sometimes you're going to see elongated holes on your upper control arm. Sometimes you're going to see eccentric cams that could be on the upper or lower control arm. Some of them you'll see shim packs, and those are a pain, but they, they were out there for years. And there you've got, on well, some of the ones like the, uh, the Bronco over here, you got bushings that are offset bushings. And they basically tell you about your, you can change your caster and camera angle with those. The ones that are in there from the factory, they've got a little wedge on them so that they can't be turned. But the one that you buy, and I've got one laying around here somewhere, I'll do that. Okay, so basically eccentric cams can be used to adjust camber and caster by moving the control arm inward or outward. Both of the top ones move out and in, that's camber. One moves out and in, that's caster. And then your toe, you'll never find anything in your front end machine telling you how to do toe adjustments because if you don't know how to do toe, toe adjustments, somebody else will be doing the work. Everybody knows you do that in the tire rods, okay? All right, now some of them you basically got to drill out some pop rivets. Up there, or like on this Taurus over here, you'd have to drill out, uh, not pop rivets, but uh, spot wheels. And that's what this is for. Uh, right there, you center punch the spot well, loosen the three nuts, use your spot well drill kit to remove the spot wheels. And you know, so you can move that thing around and, and change your angles and all that kind of stuff. Shim packs, basically when you put a shim in there, it's like the front, the, like you add shims, depending on the configuration of it, adding or subtracting shims is going to change your camber and caster accordingly, just like you would with your other. And there's your shim. See that picture of that shim, I mean, of that uh, bushing, the service adjuster bushing? It's got little wrench flats on it so you can turn it when you put it in there. You've got to take the other one out and put that one in. 
change of caster and camper when you use a service adjuster. And there's your toe adjustment. That's not a big deal right there. Everybody knows that. That's the end. Everybody learn anything? We already, we already